everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Carlos, Mauricio, Luis, thank you very much for making all of this possible. And thank you to our speakers. We have an amazing panel today. So without any further introductions, Carlos, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you, Fau, and welcome everyone to our third session of the Executive Cybersecurity Program. Today, we have an incredible panel to talk about a critical and relevant topic. As you've seen, some of the best experts in the field globally. So we, we don't have uh, time to waste. And Mauricio, you want to also give the welcome? No, thank you, Carlos. Looking forward to uh, this amazing panel. I think the region is going to benefit tremendously uh, with this amazing uh, lineup uh, of speakers. So thank you all of you for uh, giving us the opportunity to share best practices with the region. Uh, with this, please uh, go ahead and we're excited to start our third module. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our third module. Following um, the module that we previously had on the cyber kill chain and how attackers compromise companies, we're going on the defensive today. And we're going to talk about how companies can protect themselves and the ecosystem through information sharing. So I'm joined by Phil Rayner from the Institute of Security and Technology, Shiva Ram from HSBC, Megan Stiefel from the Global Cybersecurity Alliance, Anuj Goel from Cyware. Um, and Phil, I would, I'd love to start things off with you to tell us a little bit more um, at a high level, what does information sharing mean in the context of cybersecurity and why is it important? Sure, H happy to help kick things off and, and very much um, uh, happy to be here as, as part of this panel, very much looking forward to the, the conversation. Thank you very much for, for hosting this. I think it's absolutely critical at, at this point in time that this be a conversation that we not only instigate here today, but that's something that, that remains ongoing that people are engaging in this sort of discussion uh, going forward. The, I think the importance of information sharing is really best uh, elucidated if we take a look at some use cases, some, some instances of where it has proven to be incredibly helpful as industry and as governments try to actually tackle this challenge of cybersecurity. And I think something that has remained at the forefront of my thinking and, and Megan's as well uh, is a pretty easy use case to point to, which is the question of ransomware and, and thinking about how to solve a problem like ransomware, I think is one of the best examples of where information sharing really is absolutely critical when thinking about how to defend your organization, thinking about how to defend your nation. And so what I'll do very quickly is I'll point back to an effort that we undertook earlier this year at the Institute for Security and Technology, along with the Global Cyber Alliance, was we put together what was called the Ransomware Task Force. And this, in its essence, was a global effort to pull together organizations to think about how to solve the ransomware threat from a comprehensive perspective. Now, why, why, why do I bring this up? It, it's really important because no single one of those organizations could solve this problem by themselves. No single one of those organizations has enough information, has enough capabilities, has enough manpower to actually solve the ransomware threat. How do we actually solve the ransomware threat? Well, all of those organizations and governments have to work together, share intelligence, real-time intelligence with one another in order to actually understand the criminals that are behind these activities and actually be able to defend themselves better. I think um, one of the instances that I wanted to, to point to in that regard is you look back here in the United States, there was the colonial pipeline instance, where a, a company that provides critical infrastructure services was, was hit by a ransomware attack. And at the end of the day, what really proved um, most useful was, was not just the capabilities of the United States government to try and figure out what had just happened and how to reverse what had just happened, but the fact that the private sector could see what was happening almost in real time and be able to actually work with authorities, and you can read about this in the newspapers, to work with authorities to actually seize back the data before the criminals could actually encrypt it, segment it off, and keep it from the company being able to retrieve it. That is the result of years and years of effort to build these networks of, of individuals who can communicate with each other from the private sector into the federal government and be able to share information almost in real time to be able to solve these kinds of problems. 
I think there are numerous, and we'll talk about it, I think here today on the panel, there are numerous ways that this can be done. There are formal methods for doing this in public-private partnerships and ISACs, ISALs, et cetera. But then there's informal ways of doing this as well. And I think there's a lot of folks on the call here today who are probably already familiar with both. I thought I would just take a quick second to, to note what it is that I mean by the informal side of this, which is there are communities of actors within probably many of your organizations who are actually engaged in these sorts of in intelligence and information sharing networks already. They're the ones who, in my opinion, actually keep the internet up on the day to day. They're the ones who are combating these, these attacks are the ones that are working against these criminals and against the APTs, the nation state threats. And what we see is that these groups are really small. The people who are involved in these discussions are very discreet and they're limited, which necessitates a broader ecosystem really around the world where these groups can actually be expanded upon. And that's where I think all of us can play a role in empowering those people and pushing them forward and letting them do the work that they need to do on the day-to-day -to, -day, uh, to share information so that folks can build out resilience so that they can anticipate these threats so that they can actually potentially together one of the instances i would point to is the fs isac um, global presence um, is able to exercise with its um, members is able to share information with its members is able to uh, allow folks to better defend themselves, but also be in a position where folks can actually respond more readily when something really nasty happens. And so when it comes to information sharing and, and cybersecurity, I would, I would argue that over the course of the last couple of decades, it is something that uh, many have gotten better at, but it remains, e even here in the United States, very difficult sometimes, even now. To, to make this happen. There are constraints between the private sector and the public sector. There are constraints between private and private entities. And there are constraints you know, be, within the public sector itself with departments and agencies being willing to share information in order to counter these kinds of threats. And we, I think we'll dig into to some of those details throughout the course of the conversation here today. But information sharing absolutely could not be more critical uh, in, in the cybersecurity context. No, and that leads me to, um, Megan, I'd love for you to touch a little bit on why, uh, as we speak with companies in Latin America about why it's important to start to evolve um, information sharing ecosystems, one of the biggest complaints that we see is the concern about sharing any of their vulnerabilities out into the public and what could um, the public perception, how it could affect the public perception of them down the line. Could you address a little bit about how you view it from an individual versus collective defense side? Sure, thanks Louise. And, and thanks again, everyone for having us uh, the Global Cyber Alliance in the form of the Global Cyber Alliance. Um, so I, I wanna build a, on a couple of things that, that Philip mentioned um, and, and share a bit of experience that I've had uh, in living through the information sharing maturity model in the United States. Um, there have been a range of, of issues that have been cited as, as limitations um, or barriers to entry in, in terms of information sharing. And I think um, I'll bring this back ultimately to ransomware. Uh, and and I'll, just to, to touch on a couple of them there, and I don't think that they're the unique to the United States experience. There are, of course, the, the implications from US law that, that flow down to some of these barriers, but they, I think, are actually can be cited as a global concern, the reality is that we've worked through some of them. Um, the first is liability. So Louise, you mentioned that companies may be concerned about sharing their vulnerabilities out of concern, out of concern for future um, potential litigation risk. Uh, there could be uh, suits by shareholders, et cetera. And uh, in order to incent information sharing in the United States, we passed legislation about six years ago that reduces or eliminates uh, liability for companies who share information for cybersecurity purposes. Um, and so it's really finding in, in the first instance that that um, uh, kind of circle of trust or sort of that that's that purpose for which we can build um, trust in the community and trust within um, with regulators, et cetera, that will facilitate this this kind of breaking down of the barrier of information sharing. The second concern has often been cited as antitrust, um, which, is a bit unique, but not exclusively unique to the US experience. So again, here we're thinking about, right, I don't want to share information because, or I do want to share information, you know, is it 
am I overly protective and thinking about myself only as an individual and I need to protect my own self so that I can outcompete the next individual? Um, or is it the case that, that when we share information between competitors, we're, we're actually better bolstering our collective defense, which then in turn bolsters our um, organizational defense. So again, with this legislation back about six years ago called the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, um, we reduced uh, the burden and the barrier of antitrust in the United States for organizations who are, are thinking about sharing information for cybersecurity purposes. A third piece of this, it's been, and actually this is, this is not a five-year-old conversation and it's not a 10-year-old conversation. It's um, by some accounts, I think it started in the mid nineties. Um, so there's a concern around privacy and, and a, a colleague of mine jokes that, that he found a memo on his desk. He had been at the department of justice for a long time. And, and the memo was about information sharing and it, it said antitrust liability and privacy. And it was from like 1996 or something. So this is a long standing conversation. And I'm hopeful that out of this conversation this morning, we can actually help, um, uh, expedite the, the maturity in, in LATAM. Um, so there certainly need to be privacy protections built into the information sharing process. And one of the ways that we can do that, again, thinking about, am I individually protecting myself or thinking about the broader ecosystem? Because the reality is that uh, it, it is an ecosystem and, and due to the interconnectivity, we are all vulnerable. If one of us is vulnerable, most of us are vulnerable. The ways to, to, to mitigate privacy concerns is really to think about a common lexicon for information sharing and thinking about sharing of non-content data in the first instance, because that's what's going to um, help to reduce a, a lot of risks, not all of them, and help to better manage vulnerabilities um, and threats out there. But, um, and so th this idea of building a common lexicon and then a common format, standardized format for sharing of information is one that has really taken off in the United States. Uh, there's Sticks Taxi is a format that that nobody needs to go home remembering, but to basically say, don't reinvent the wheel yourself, right? In your own organization, don't create your own common, your own format for sharing information. Use one that is already uh, up and running in, in other regions, because that's going to be able to facilitate us more expeditiously sharing information between regions and between um, communities. Um, this idea of a common lexicon also then, remember, helps reduce this privacy risk because we are able to categorize types, categorize types of information to say, this is cybersecurity threat information and it is non-content information. It doesn't involve the personal information about a victim per se. Again, thinking back to companies' concerns. Well, if you're sharing information that is not related to, um, that is related to cybersecurity threats and not about um, yourself per se, uh, I would rather be in the, in the positive position of having shared that information than having known it and withheld it. I think the, the risk there for, for down the road problems is higher. Um, the final thing I'll say is that, that in the United States, we've grown through, Philip mentioned the FSI SAC, and really the financial services sector in the United States was ahead of the game when it came to information sharing. There, uh, the FSI SAC predates this cybersecurity legislation that, that's now six years old. There have been a number of other industry-specific information sharing and analysis centers, that's what ISAC stands for. Likewise, we've um, spawned this idea, or spurn, spawned this idea of information sharing and analysis organizations. And those are organizations that aren't industry specific per se, but are thinking about managing a particular threat. Um, so this maturity in the United States has really grown uh, in industries. And, and part of the reason for that was in, in looking at threat actors in this kind of over the past decade, there was at the time this uh, likelihood that, that uh, advanced persist persistent threat actors would use the common techniques to target a particular sector. If I'm targeting the uh, financial sector, I'm going to use these tactics, techniques, and procedures. If I'm targeting the aviation sector, I'm going to use something slightly different. Ransomware has really broken that model, I think. Um, and so if you look at the types of actors who are targeting uh, critical infrastructure, it's it's all sectors of critical infrastructure, right? We had Colonial Pipeline, we had meatpacking, we've had insurance, um, services sector. So this need to develop and, and, and utilize common formats, share with industry partners, but really then get more broadly to sharing kind of across those, those top lines of information sharing and analysis centers is critical to this collective defense uh, approach. Um, I will close by mentioning that, that um, we've given some carrots in the United States uh, and I think that those are critical of thinking about kind of what's the policy approach from the government in, in trying to get more organizations to share information. Um, there is now, I think just yesterday I was or hearing this morning that, that the sticks are coming out um, and the stick in this case is uh, the United States government is a huge um, procurer. I think most national governments buy a lot of goods and services and they're therefore able to 
dictate uh, requirements in the market that can actually help raise the, the cybersecurity level of the market. Um, one of the, the pathways that the United States has taken to enhance its cybersecurity is to use this procurement power of the government to boost cybersecurity within the marketplace and within the economy. Um, but it, it appears, and we still know that incidents are, are still not being reported. Um, there is a requirement under US law now that if you sell goods and services to the government, I'm generalizing, uh, you have to report a cybersecurity incident. It now sounds as if the Department of Justice is going to bring, uh, pursue actors who don't report incidents. Um, consistent with U.S. law or require, under, as required under U.S. law. So thinking about, again, um, the in, this carrots and the sticks that can be offered and developed through national policy and legislation to build this, um, to support the trust environment. It already exists. Philip mentioned the, the informal trust environment. Um, but we really need to, to not just rely on these informal networks. We need to think about formality and thinking about lexicon and um, uh, the opportunity for consistency where possible um, across different sectors is one that I think is helpful to, to consider. And hopefully it will not take 15 years to, to, to get us to where we are. And as I would totally agree with Philip that we have a long way to go, but um, right somewhere I think is, the, is one of the keys that's going to, to break this cycle. No, and, and Megan, both you and Phil um, spoke a little bit about the rise of ransomware, and I think Colonial Pipeline is a great example with DarkSide in particular using ransomware as a service. So Shiva, it'd be great if you could talk to us a little bit about what's happening on the attacker side in terms of how they are um, collaborating and sharing their own experience and intelligence on attacking um, companies. and. Ultimately, we'll we'll bring this back to the offensive side, but it, uh, back to the defensive side. But it would great be great to get your perspective on what's occurring on the offensive um, ecosystem. Um, thanks for having me. Um, you know, so so usually, you know, the defenders are always one step behind. Um, you know, and um, you know, some of the advances actually have been made by the you know the, the offense, you know, or the bad guys, you know, like who actually try to find ways in the existing systems. Um, loopholes and and ways to break into existing systems or, or you know break the controls in that they're always thinking ahead so you know they're always one step ahead in most cases we are always you know like one step behind um, you know one of the things that they do very well is actually share information in on dark websites and forums and chat rooms and everything else um, like for example HSBC has a huge threat intelligence organization we also use outsourced uh, you know information where we are actually actively looking for in you know, like our guys go into chat rooms and then look for information. We also source information from other people who actually on, are on those uh, forums as well. So they actually have a pretty good, um, you know, information sharing network. We are the ones catching up, number one. Number two is, um, you know, uh, the, the, the whole, um, you know, you mentioned ransomware as a service. Now, ransomware as a service primarily is like, you know, somebody writes the code, somebody, you know, like, creates the service and then everybody else, you know, like I, I just go in and, you know, like I don't have, I don't necessarily myself have the skills, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use somebody else's, you know, like tools to actually go and, you know, um, you know, make some money. Right. So, um, you know, it's almost like a product. Now, th this is again, you know, um, you know, a single, a single, um, you know, attack vector or attack uh, service is now able to be used, leveraged by multiple actors and attack multiple um, you know customers and it basically just scales up you know dramatically because you know instead of one person writing their own code and then doing their own stuff you now have the same code being used exploited by you know like hundreds of people and hitting hundreds of countries hundreds of you know services hundreds of you know uh, websites and stuff or, or networks and stuff right so that becomes a huge problem and it, it immediately you know the, the graph goes up so we are actually catching up, you know, like, so we are actually behind the, you know, the curve here. So, you know, like, you know, compared to, you know, the, the attackers. So um, that is a significant, um, you know, like point, um, you know, so the, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, like Megan also mentioned, you know, like the information sharing, right? So um, one of the things that we talk about is, um, you know, a lot of organizations have problems about sharing information because they may uh, be revealing information about, um, you know, their own organization, their own controls or whatever. Um, you don't actually have to reveal, um, you know, only the successful attacks, right? So you're basically trying to let people know, you know, like, so let's say somebody comes and, you know, like tries, tries the lock, right? You know, like just tries, you know, like on the door, you know, just tries the lock. 
you know, like, so, um, you know, or just pick it with something, right? You know, like, so all, all you're trying to say is, and they may not be successful, but at least you are saying to, or you're sharing the information that, you know, this was tried, this type of attack was tried, you know, like, and, you know, you, use that information. Maybe you are not vulnerable, somebody else may be vulnerable, right? Um, you know, maybe your impact, even if you got hit, you know, and the attack itself was successful, maybe the impact to you is not as much, but other may, others may have a higher impact. Uh, depending on you know like their industry, their you know how their uh, organization is set up, you know like infrastructure is set up and everything else. So that is something that you know we need to you know care about. Um, the other <clears throat> other um, you know thing, one thing you know like I would keep talking about is the response planning, right? So you know the response planning is basically you know like what happens when you do you know um, get attacked. The problem with that is a lot of people think about response planning after they are attacked or in the process of an attack. You know that's already it's like you know as you are dying you're writing a will right you know like and that's not the best time to actually do it you know like you want to do this and be prepared ahead of time um you know and and rehearse it you know like so one of the things that you can actually do is automate some of your process you know like a lot of the security vendors actually provide automatic creation in the sticks you know like you know the sticks and taxi right so you don't actually have to do anything they already package it for you as part of their tools you just basically enable it and then um, you know, Phil also talked about, um, you know, the formal and the informal networks. So, for example, your security provider can actually have, um, you know, their own, you know, uh, or a in security infrastructure provider can have their own, you know, uh, local, you know, like our, their customer base that can share information, um, regardless of whether you're sharing it with external parties or ISACs or whatever, right? You know, like you could still do it there. So any extra information that you have in terms of attacks, even before you're attacked and you prepare for it, is actually good, right? And and you also, you know, like share your information. So it's always two way, you know, like it's not always gonna be just one way, right? You know, like, so it's two way. So you share your information, they share their information and it's usually anonymized. So it doesn't actually tell you which, um, you know, organization got hit or whatever, or, you know, where the attack was perpetrated. You know, it is usually anonymized. So, you know, you can actually, you know, share that information as well. So, um, you know, to answer, um, you, know, um, you know, the question, the, the primary thing is the bad guys are already doing it you know, and they are going to be success successful, um, you know, and they are successful, you know, with all the, you know, the ransomware. So we have seen, you know, like, so over the last three, four years, you know, on our customer base, you know, like we have seen, like, I, we used to see like one or two attacks per year. And, you know, like, with, you know, like in the last, uh, you know, this year alone, um, you know, my team alone has uh, dealt with customer attacks, almost two attacks per week, um, you know, on our customers where we help them continue their business, you know, like doing, you know, payments and stuff like that. So, you know, that is like, you know, like dramatically increased, um, you know, and, um, you know, we got to, you know, we got to catch up really quick. And the good thing is we already have the templates from, you know, certain countries. We just have to follow that template, you know, like, and then apply. So, you know, your, uh, you know, the curve, you know, the, the learning curve is, you know, uh, sharper. Hey, Luis, can I, can I say something yeah, about that? Just Shiva was just saying, I think one of the things that's been fascinating in the in the effort to better understand ransomware and combat it is understanding the extent to which the the criminal ecosystem really is watching what the private and public sectors are doing in order to defend themselves and reacting accordingly. And so just as Shiva was saying, like they are, it is a tight network of individuals who are actually working together in these criminal enterprises to take advantage of the the gaps in information sharing, to take advantage of the gaps between public and private in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere around the world. And, and something I wanted to, to say on this is they are looking to seize upon where we are falling down. And, and they're very, very adept at it. They're quick and, and they're very smart about it. It's a business model. They are looking to make money. And at the end of the day, they're, they're watching everything that we do. I just, I thought that was worth it, injecting as well. Um, no, so yeah, sorry. One more, one more point is that you know, like this is like Phil just mentioned, it's big business, right? You know, like and for that return of investment, you know, like a bad actor can actually insert people into organizations, you know, like to um, enable uh, loopholes or understand the the infrastructure. So it's actually lucrative, you know, like so you can actually they can actually spend the money to do that. Um, you know, yeah, that is you know just one more point I wanted to make. It's basically big business, you know, like it's it's like spycraft pretty much. Well, now that we're all sufficiently terrified, Anuj, can you talk to us how we can, how um, the companies in the audience today can approach building their own information sharing um, systems in-house and also how they can better collaborate with others in the ecosystem? 
Perfect. No, definitely. Thanks. To, thanks for having me at least again. For, uh, and first of all, I agree with all fellow panelists here as they kind of talked about the problem. And I think uh, if I go back and start to uh, look at as a whole, and, and, and we can talk about like this being there for like 25 years, right? Uh, so it's not a new problem to solve. It's just that how we solve the problem, and how we become smarter to Sigur's point, right? Uh, it, the attackers are always a step ahead of us, right? So how do we become smarter to protect ourselves proactively and, and make, whether we call it, you know, actionable intel or anything else more on the technical side, really uh, uh, we understand like uh, what action we need to take before they take that, that action. Uh, so if we if we start to kind of divide this into like maybe three parts, like, you know, why information sharing? I think we have discussed that, you know, in detail here, then how, the, how to share and again, what's the ROI? Uh, because everyone asks like, you know, hey, why do I share, right? Let, you know, I be part of the network, let everyone else share and I just receive and, you know, protect myself. But at, this is now exactly how it works, right? Uh, so, I mean, one thing I can say, uh, uh, and, and going back to like, you know, the points that, that were made, uh, the why part, first of all, how it, you know, where it came from. So it really, information sharing is not new or intel sharing is not new. This is a concept that in private sector, if you go back, you know, how agencies share with each other, like, you know, FBI will find something, the bureau will go to like, you know, agency and, you know, share with them because there may be some international connection to something they find, find locally. Uh, here in the United States, right? So all of that has been already done. It's just that now in past 10 years or so, we have started to apply exactly the same that is proven technique to uh, to fight with attackers or bad actors in cyber world, right? So that's the first thing to understand. So what we are doing is is something that is a proven model and, and, and faster we all from the org side, whether, you know, build more ISAC, build more ISOs, uh, we do that, then we'll be able to, you know, go go and defend ourselves as a community as a whole. Um, and now the, going to the more how part, right? Uh, the, I think one of the challenges that we see has been uh, in the industry where we all understand that, you know, it's a good good thing to share. Uh, everyone has good intent, even though within sectors, uh, the companies may be like rivals, but they're, they're still sharing with each other. The, the, their security teams are working together as one team because we all understand, like, it's not about... Uh, you know, my uh, peer company or, or competitor from my you know, sector getting attacked is going to benefit me. Like, no, from cyber attack, everyone loses. No, nobody wins if, if, if a peer company gets attacked, right? It's, so, so from that angle, again, if you all understand the ROI part, how and how has been a big challenge in the industry, if you see, uh, uh, where uh, the information sharing has been manual. And that's the part is changing in past three to four years. We have seen that where, there are now platforms available that can allow you to uh, share uh, automatically. Again, and Shivas uh, you know, talked about like, you know, automation and information sharing. It's not like somebody has to remember when, when there is an active attack, I have to remember to go and share with my ISAC or share with my network. It does not happen. I mean, can I have my, uh, 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 my monitoring system connected to it and set rules that can allow me to automatically share with relevant parties, whether I'm part of one or two ISACs, whether I'm part of my own small network that I have built, whether I have to report those two back to GCA, right? So GCA can take that and give it to like, you know, others who can also protect from, you know, same CNBNS information, others uh, can also defend themselves, right? So all of that need to be automated of how I share with those parties who need to have, so they can further share in a trusted environment and reaches to as many uh, organizations or other, other parties who can protect themselves. So I think that that is one part. Certainly uh, uh, the, the anonymization of like, you know, would my, you know, uh, uh, identity of who, who am I will be revealed to other organizations or uh, big concerns that again, Megan also uh, 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 you know, mentioned about liability, right? If I share this with private sector, uh, uh, would somebody kind of knock my door tomorrow? Like you had this incident, right? And now, now you are, so all of those things have been done. I mean, these, these things were concerns in early 2000s, or, but based on how the laws have matured, where there have been liability protections provided, where those tools have been built, where they can anonymize information before it leaves your organization or it stays within, within uh, your ISAC. So no one else who receives this would, will ever know who, who faced this attack. It would be, yes, a large banking organization or a large... Uh, retailer had this attack in this reason, but no more information to be shared with the other party. So all of those concerns, sometimes people have around, if I share, if I participate in the sharing, 
uh, uh, would I would I be like you know adding to more of a legal risk or cyber risk for my organization? That that's not the case. Uh, so these are few few things. Uh, uh, now, information sharing has gone beyond ISACs, uh, and uh, Philip also mentioned about ISOs, where now organizations are coming together to form small circles. So it could be like you know ten organizations, top ten banks in in a country or within a region or you know some retail organization coming together and forming that while they're, they're also part of the retail isec while they're also part of their sectorial isec they're also starting to form within the in a specific reason we have seen this in the united states here as well like in northeast ohio there are companies come together they share actively with each other in arizona there is a you know full network where they're sharing information doesn't matter they're from multiple sectors and they're now starting to share with each other so uh, we are starting to see that trend and as that trend continues and as those networks start sharing with bigger ISACs, kind of forming a global uh, cross-sector sharing or cross-sector ISOs, that is already starting to happen. So th that could be a big benefit for the uh, sharing uh, uh, discussions that, that we started from around 20 years ago. So again, uh, highly recommend uh, where uh, uh, the last point I'll make that not only just uh, organizations are forming by bringing those peer organizations within, the, within their geography or within their sectors to share, large organizations are forming their own ISACs. So if you're a large organization, you can start build your own ISAC where you become the hub and your vendors become the members of in a, in a similar fashion. So your vendors will uh, obviously, initially, you would be sharing with your vendors to make sure if you receive any information about a vulnerability or malware advisory, you quickly share in real time with them so they can also protect their environment. It's very important, not just you are protected, but your vendors are as well. So uh, because, you know, recent at attacks that we have seen is more of a supply chain attacks or, you know, HVAC company uh, getting attacked and that, you know, attackers coming through that company to, to your organization. So as we have seen those vendors, uh, 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 driven attacks, why, why don't you build your own ISAC to protect your vendors as much protection you're bringing or, or implementing in your organization? So that is something is, is, is now becoming very common. Large organizations are building their own X company name ISAC and, and they're sharing that information with their, with their vendors who will never have access to that kind of intel that a parent company will have. And then slowly we are seeing that where vendors start to share back as well, they're opening up because they're seeing like we are, we are receiving this information from our, uh, our client. They also share back when we see, see something important, which again, this as an ISAC can share back with other, other vendors within, the, within that community. So multiple ways, like sharing doesn't have to be always ISAC driven because but, although they're the ones who are primarily have been driving this, this effort, but there are many other uh, types of uh, ISOs have been formed to enable sharing within you know different sectors and different geographies. So that's a phenomenal point. And I, as I was um, listening as you were talking, something that came to mind is as we've spoken to many CISOs across Latin America, many of them are doing informal sharing through WhatsApp or email. Why, and I'll put this to the group, why may that not be the most efficient um, means of information sharing and not to, dive too deeply into the, the technology behind or the technical aspects, but what would you recommend um, as an organization is looking to start their own information sharing community? Um, I can I jump can... in if you want. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, I'll, I'll just start this off actually. So, um, you know, with, with an example possibly, you know, like, so, you know, like when, 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 um, you know, I say something to my wife, you know, like, so she'll say, you know, like, what is the context? What are you saying? What are you talking about? You know, and that is the critical part here. So what happens is when you have a uh, indicator of compromise, you know, let's say, you know, like you are seeing an attack from a particular uh, IP address, let's say, you know, like, so you are just sharing the IP address or in your mind, in your organization's mind, you know, like, or in whoever is running your uh, infrastructure, in their mind, they know that, you know, the attack is originating here, you know, like, and that is what, you know, you're trying to share. So I'm giving somebody a bad IP. But what does that mean, you know, like for them without the context of that information, right? So they have, you know, like they know what do they, do they block it? Do they, you know, like, am I not supposed to send anything out to that? Or am I not supposed to take anything in from it? What does it mean? You know, so that that is an issue. So the context, so that is why we have, you know, like standardized formats, um, you know, and then, you know, like you also want to make sure 
that it's real time, you know, like, so you want to do it as quickly as possible so that, you know, like more people, like we talked about the scaling. So the single ransomware as a service kind of a thing can immediately happen across multiple industries, multiple countries, multiple organizations in one shot, in one second. That to avoid that, you know, you need to have protection as well as, you know, uh, protection also in the same, um, you know, uh, way. And you also have to communicate in the same language. So, which is again, where, you know, sticks comes in, you know, like, and, uh, you know, the standardized formats come in. Everybody needs to talk the same language. If I'm going to tell you something and I, I include the context in my, in my understanding, however it feels, um, you know, and I don't include all the relevant information, you may not be able to act on it. So, you know, like that is exactly why you want to have, you know, like a, a standardized format. So and with that, right. I, will, I will hand it off to uh, Anuj. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, uh, so contextually, the part definitely, I totally agree with Shiva on that. Like, you know, if, if you share more uh, in a, a, a structured way over WhatsApp or messengers, right? Uh, one, that information is staying in your messenger that does, that does not become actionable. Two, it is unstructured, so you know, it's not following any any specific method. So that means that when someone needs to search, you know, historically over seven year, you know, past seven year of data, you will not be able to get, get that just because it is in, in it is in those uh, messaging forums. Uh, three, uh, the TLP, I mean, the whole uh, uh, reason uh, behind the information sharing as we start to build and it started to standardize, who should have access to that information? Now I have received a piece of information. How? And what I can do with that? Can I share it with someone in, in my organization? Can I share this with outside of my organization? So whole uh, traffic light protocol or TLP, uh, there are different levels of TLP. So that actually uh, 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 ensures that information reaches to the point it should and not beyond. So that is very important. You can't do that like, you know, over, over Messenger. And then fourth piece I would say is automation. Again, uh, if, if you're not automating, you're, where again, there's a human behind, yes, I have to remember to share, so messengers are good for just a quick chatting and understanding a problem. So I, but at the same time, when you need to share actual information, then you need to have the more standardized way of doing it. Again, whether uh, if, it, if, we are, if, it, if they have IOCs, then it needs to happen over sticks and taxi. If it is more uh, a malware advisory or, or, or a vulnerability, information also needs to be more structured way so it can stay in a database that becomes searchable over years, not just you know, over the past few days. Uh, I, I would just I, oh. yeah, Megan, go ahead. Um, okay, I will. Uh, <laughs> I think I would sort of summarize it as two things in, in part, um, scale and redundancy. So if we push indicators through WhatsApp, they, as, as I think Anuja and, and Shiva has said, don't necessarily get to all the places they, they could, um, where if we're sharing through organizations such as ISACs, ISAOs, there's also something called the Cyber Threat Alliance, which there are um, already members from LATAM in that group, and they essentially are a, a very uh, scalable platform to distribute uh, indicators. Um, you know, scale can happen more quickly through these, these other structures. The redundancy piece, and I, I don't mean it to sound like a joke, but if you're using WhatsApp and they have another configuration problem, you're out of luck. Um, so these informal networks are, are, as I totally agree with Anuj, they're helpful to kind of chit chat back and forth, but I would be thinking about wanting to ensure that there is, I'm sharing important information on a platform that is intended for that use because it's, it presumably has uh, done some risk calculations and ascertained what it needs to be um, aware of in order to remain up. Uh, and let's not also think about kind of backups, right? Um, so certainly the, the information sharing platforms that we have that others have talked about have, have some of these capabilities in mind. Um, the last piece I would say too is just to think also again about the privacy implications. I did play a lawyer in my prior life. Um, and, and certainly with different types of uh, data regulations and impacting organizations, uh, sharing information that might be subject to those regulations outside of uh, channels that are intended and, and actually created for those purposes can potentially pose a liability issue. Thanks. Sorry, Philip. No, no I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think the, the only other thing that I would inject is that is there is a time and place for these sorts of informal communications in these instances, right? When there's a, where there's a, a, a really catastrophic incident that's underway, perhaps there's going to be informal channels that need to be utilized in order to move quickly. There are Slack channels that are stood up that people work on on a consistent basis where they share information that is outside of sticks. It's outside of some of those more formal channels. Um, there, there is a usefulness for that. And I think there's a time and place for it, but these more uh, formal mechanisms, it, it needs to be a combination of, of really all of the above and, and everything else, everybody else said, you know, WhatsApp is wholly insufficient. You can have a 
you can have a signal group where folks are chatting about an incident or trying to take on a certain um, strain or a certain uh, cartel. But at the end of the day, yeah, you need formal mechanism at the same time for it to be sustainable. So before we turn over to q and I would love final thoughts on what, what do you recommend for the participants of the audience and the different countries in Latin America that are represented today as they consider building out their own systems in-house and also from a regulation standpoint? Um, based on all of the information that we've had over the last 10 years in the US, what would you recommend um, for them to do differently or to keep the same as other models globally? Maybe Anuj, we can start with you. Sure, uh, so uh, my, my again, suggestion and request will be again, when, when we start seeing uh, the cyber attacks going mainstream where uh, when we go to ga like gas station and you don't have gas because of a cyber you know attack, not because of a hurricane or any other weather event. When you uh, you know go to the hospital and you can't get to uh, get the surgery just because like you know hospital systems have been you know uh, taken over by ransomware gangs. Uh, the only way we can you know protect while having the basic you know protection or technology the tools that you need uh, from 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 the uh, different security controls perspective is on top also build or, or participate in information sharing because that's the only way you can be proactive because everything else like, you know, helps you in reactively, uh, 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 you know, respond to, to an attack. But if you want to do it proactively when someone else has seen this attack, you receive that indicator, you uh, put protection or block the indicator. So same actor is attacking you who attacked your neighbor, you know, within your region or sector now will not be successful is the only way you can proactively be, you know, um, on, on the defender side. Uh, I'd be happy to have others jump in, but the one thing that I would um, impart is um, to, to be as proactive about this as possible and not to just expect that it isn't going to be your problem. It's, it's only a matter of time. The, until this becomes your problem, and it needs to be an, a, a very, you know, the utmost priority. And again, I point back to this ransomware set of concerns. If you haven't been hit yet, it's 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 coming. Um, it sometimes is in, indiscriminate, but sometimes it's very discriminate, and it's very much looking for those those larger targets. I think the the thing that we are consistently uh, pointing to is there are very simple things that can be done, and this information sharing piece of it is one of those. And getting after it now will prevent those catastrophes of the future. So don't don't push it off. Plan now. Make sure that you've got those playbooks in place. Make sure that you've got those relationships. Make sure you've built that trust, so that if and when it does happen, that you're already prepared um, and and you're better defended to make sure that you, as was asked in the in the Q and A, you raise the bar, you raise the cost of doing business for these criminals. You make it more difficult for them to, to get after you and your ecosystem. And you can really only do that collectively. I'll, um, I'll let Shiva have the last word on this piece and just say that I think you know, information sharing is, is critical and it's key, but it's not the only, um, it's not the only defense. So you, you cannot, at the same time as you're advancing your information sharing uh, efforts, forget the basics of network defense and ensuring that you're kind of following um, best practices for your particular um, organization and, and really thinking about sort of the, the common, what for many of us are kind of considered to be common tactics that are still just not being used, things like multi-factor authentication. And, and we've already talked about the importance of backups, but uh, another important one is to ensure that we have, um, you know, there's a, a regular, regular process for patching, which is not always easy in large environments, but is essential. Um, yeah, so Megan, you know, like I think you um, already mentioned a couple of points that I was going to mention, you know, like patching and, uh, you know, the basics, right? So, you know, the patching and uh, making sure that, you know, um, you know, uh, and I think Philip also mentioned the response planning. Uh, that is something that I keep talking about with customers all the time because, you know, like don't wait until the last minute, you know, like so have a plan ready and rehearse it. Having a plan, having a playbook is of no use if you don't know how, whether that is even practical or not. So you have to rehearse it. You have to, sim, you know, like simulate attacks, you know, like try to figure out what happens. And, you know, yeah, like information 
information sharing is one piece of the puzzle, uh, but it is a significant piece because now you can actually use other people's knowledge, you know, like to protect yourself and you can share in that knowledge as well. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you need to focus on all pieces, not just one piece. Uh, and information sharing is one piece, you know, and the rest of the stuff is also there uh, as critical. And Louise, I think uh, it, just one other thing, you had mentioned regulatory activity, right? Where to, to think about where, where things may go, I would, I would point to where things are in the United States right now, where there has long been a conversation between the public and private sectors about the private sector taking greater um, initiative in order to, to take the steps that, that Shiva and, and Anuj and, and and Megan, we're just talking about those basic cyber hygiene steps in order to shore up their defenses to an extent has not been happening. And so that's why Megan was, you know, pointing to what, you know, the U.S. Department of Justice just pointed out yesterday, which is that they're going to now be holding people legally accountable, at least those who are contracting with the USG, um, for not taking those steps. So those, those regulatory constraints that you may want to avoid, you may not desire for your business um, well, avoid them by maybe taking more of these steps to, to actually increase that level of cyber hygiene, increase those defenses so that the, the regulatory authorities don't step in uh, in these environments to actually enforce it upon you. I think the, the fact is, is the, uh, the U.S. Congress has, has now kind of reached a point where they're just going to impose more restrictions, more requirements, and, and that's, that's the trajectory we're currently on. Um, just to add to that point, we are actually, you know, because we support multiple, uh, you know, we are global bank, you know, like, so we support multiple uh, jurisdictions, you know, with regulators, um, you know, we are, this is not just US, you know, like, so more regu more regulators actually are uh, focusing, including with, uh, you know, Mexico, for example, the chapter 10 requirements, you know, like, and a lot of, you know, the countries are actually getting more prescriptive. It's not just, you know, like, they don't just ask us, hey, what are you doing anymore? They're actually saying, you need to do this, um, you know, and that basically, you know, sometimes can be a pain because, you know, like, they are asking, giving us a timetable, you know, like, to fix certain things or, or do certain things uh, and enhancements and stuff. But that is, that is the direction that we are going, you know, like, more and more regulators are actually getting more active and prescriptive. Megan, I'm, I'm sure you have plenty of thoughts here on the regulatory side. Do you want to add a final word? Um, well, it may not make me uh, very <laughs> welcome in this in this community, but you know, we um, about ten years ago, and it, there have been other efforts before, but there was an effort in the United States to 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 essentially have occur then what is occurring now, which is to say there are now finally these requirements being placed upon an industry. Um, and industry, for reasons that are many reasonable, but some perhaps less reasonable, uh, really resisted that, that application at that time. And I do wonder now kind of where we would be at this point in time if we had been less reluctant to um, at least accept some additional requirements around information sharing. Unfortunately, we aren't, and here we are. So, um, you know, I, I would think about, you know, regulation can be your friend because often it does come with these carrots as well and thinking about what's what's reasonable and, and really working with regulators to figure out that kind of sweet spot of um, if, if it, I think in many cases it unfortunately is, unfortunately is necessary. Um, making sure at the same time though that the regulatory requirements are not so uh, discreet or specific that they, they can't keep pace with uh, what's, what's evolving and emerging. And, and to, to understand that there really needs to be a dialogue between industry and regulators um, and so this idea of really building trust and being pretty open about um, what it's like day to day in, in your particular organization to manage these risks and how, um, what shape regulatory requirements can take to be actually useful as opposed to creating additional burden. That's a fantastic point. Um, so given the time right now, Mao, I'll turn to you to go through some of the Q&A. Yeah, so, sounds good. And I mean, as, uh, as, as the whole team here and, and Megan was just reinforcing right now, uh, we definitely see this as, as a global thing. Uh, mm -hmm. As Shiva was saying, is it's not about one country or the other. I think the biggest challenge is how can we best practice so we can quickly in the region catch up and then support the initiatives, right? Because if something happens outside certain legislations, then there's no penalties, no, no policies, no regulation or nothing. So all the efforts done in one place in something like this that is global, 
uh, does not fulfill the, the cost. No? And I think one of the questions here from Cynthia Ramirez is talking a little bit about uh, what articles, and I think this, this is moving, as you were saying, Phil, constantly, what articles, what type of legislations or what type of penalties are people getting if there's an attack or if there's something going on? And what are some of the, the global uh, or international um, cybersecurity groups that are kind of leading this? And I think this question ties really nice into it because, you know, it's, if the region needs to best practice and catch up quickly into these type of topics, this is a, a great way to point people or to address the audience as to where they should be looking at to catch up in this perspective. So where would you, anybody can jump in in the, in the forum. Maybe we can start with you, Phil, as to, and then Megan or anybody, but where should people go and look for these type of sanctions, these type of things, just to see how they can quickly change that regulation in, in, in Latin America? I think that that is a very broad question. There's a number of different facets of this. I think um, I would actually say Megan can probably speak to this more intelligently than, than I can. I think on, on the international level, uh, the, the way the question was phrased, right, was, you know, is anyone on the international level in charge of this? No. Um, there, there are organizations that are working together to try and help um, govern and create norms and create kind of rules of the road, but there is not necessar necessarily someone that's on an international level setting rules by which folks have to uh, behave. Maybe if you look into the, the financial sector, there may be more stringent uh, requirements that are put in place in terms of what folks have to live up to uh, in order to just maintain and operate their businesses. But generally speaking from a governance perspective, no, on the international level, not. One thing that comes to mind, and, and I would defer to, to others to speak to this as well, is in the U.S. instance, uh, just, just this year, there was an executive action, so an action taken by the Biden administration, an executive order that laid down very, like, almost insanely specific details on what organizations are going to have to be able to do in order to contract with the U.S. government. And that gets down into you have to enforce two-factor authentication, you have to segment, you have to use zero trust architecture, whatever it is they mean by that, people are trying to figure out. Um, I think there are um, numerous, and it's, I think it was 40 pages long of detailed um, instructions as to, as to how that's going to uh, need to go going forward. I think as we, as we speak, Congress is working on legislation on the incident, the breach reporting side of the house, uh, legislation that may mandate um, reporting requirements for anyone who does pay a ransomware payment. Um, there's a there's a couple of people you can look at the I think it's the Peters legislation. Uh, there was another one that came out this week from uh, Abigail Spanberger. So there's there's an array of that are moving through the process, and then that more recent one from the USG. But I'd also I turn to Megan because again, like I said, I think she can speak more intelligently to this than I can. I don't know about that. I think what I would suggest is that um, looking at industry peers in in partner markets um, can be helpful. I think there's you know there are uh, while there may not be kind of a global consortium, there are um, relationships. For example, in there's the uh, G7 relationships, and then it's kind of the specific industry specific efforts. Um, so the finance ministers of the G7 thinking about the work that they're doing on crypto, for example, um, and, and really looking at kind of who's, who are involved in those efforts. I think I would be um, remiss if I didn't note that I think it, we, what we probably don't want as, as uh, both those interested in cybersecurity and, and those interested in, in a market a functioning market economy is for there suddenly to be kind of a, a one size fits all approach. Um, and, and by that, I mean really one that's kind of dominated and directed from a purely multilateral framework or through a purely multilateral framework. I think my predecessors have said to me and told me, and I, I've, I've now lived it and experienced it. And I think it's absolutely accurate that that uh, frameworks that are around technology that are, are led almost exclusively from, from governments don't always actually succeed. Um, and that instead what's what's really necessary is looking at this through a multi-stakeholder effort. And there are a number of those underway in the cybersecurity space. 
um, there, which are kind of very, very high level, but there was something called the Paris Call a couple of years ago uh, that talks about kind of some, some specific principles around the use of information communications technologies or sometimes known as the internet. Um, there are efforts, um, there's an effort called the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise that's really looking kind of at the civil society level to build capacity. Um, so I think, you know, you can think about GFC as an equivalent maybe to, to kind of these industry groups that follow um, the kind of regulated space. And that's where I would be looking at to, to, to seek guidance is kind of from the, the next rung out of the, regu of the regulatory environment in particular communities. Okay. Um, just to add one more point, um, you know, like, yeah, you, you may not want to wait on the regulation to come in or a legislation to come in because they are usually small. And sometimes in some in cases, an organization can actually be non-existent by the time the legislation comes in because you have already been attacked and you have basically, you know, like got been run out of the business, right? So you don't want to wait for legislation to come in, you know, like you want to actually act on, you know, like, so there are multiple industries that have their own standards. So for example, PCI, you know, if you're using cards, there are already PCI DSS standards. There are different, you know, health, you know, like, so there are different, you know, um, uh, industries that have standards and not, you know, like my session would be to follow that. And not try to just do what the legislation asks you to do, you know, like try to be, you know, a little ahead, understand your risk and understand, um, you know, and, and try to do, um, try to mitigate your risk, you know, like instead of, um, you know, just waiting for legislation to make you do certain things. So I know some, you know, in some organizations, that is the only way you can actually get, you know, justification for doing certain things. But in general, you know, legislation is like, you know, five, 10 years, possibly even longer late. And you don't want to, you know, like wait for that time mm -hmm. You know, because your company can actually go for a, you know, like go under in that time because of because of an attack. Oh, incredibly interesting, and thank you all. I think we're we're out of time, unfortunately, but this is an incredibly important topic. And I'll, my biggest takeaway from this session today is this is something that we don't necessarily need to wait for regulators to start paying attention to. This is something that the public, the private sector, can start to push almost immediately with their different supply chain groups, um, different um, companies in the same industry, and ultimately sharing information across the cyber ecosystem is beneficial for everyone. Um, so I hope you all found the session as interesting as I did. And I'll turn it over to Mal for final words. No, thank you everyone. I think it was an amazing panel. I think uh, from our region perspective, we need to make sure we're looking at what the world is doing on this uh, perspective. We need to catch up a lot into it. As you're all been saying, don't wait for others to act. We need to be coordinated and make sure that companies are uh, pushing the, the right solutions uh, and the right things in place and have a plan in place. So thank you so much, uh, Shiva, Megan, Phil, Anush. Thank you, uh, Luis, for coordinating the panel and Carlos for the support from an HSBC perspective. I think uh, amazing uh, panel, lots of things. There, there'll be, I'm sure, lots of follow-ups, uh, best practices. If anybody's more interested, we definitely can uh, do more follow-up into it. Thank you again for sharing all this. And with this, we, we close the session today. And we just remind you not to miss next week. We have a, an amazing panel next uh, uh, October 13th, next week around uh, C-suite executives. We have some amazing uh, speakers as well. Um, CISOs from global companies, you know, um, Salesforce, Dropbox, et cetera. So it's going to be quite interesting, but thank you again for everyone in today. And uh, it was amazing. So yeah. thank you. And thanks for having us. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.